Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sharon Danks, and I'm, I'm with Green Schoolyards America. I'm here with my colleague today, Lauren McKenna, also of Green Schoolyards America, and our guest speakers, Rebecca Katz and Mary uh, Palumbo. And Lauren will, will give us the uh, introduction for our wonderful speakers. Thanks. Hi, everyone. So we are going to hear from Mary Palumbo. Um, she is the nature-based learning lead for Get Outdoors Leadville. She joined the GOL team to support the continued growth of the GOL gear library and is excited to make sure that all families in Leadville have an opportunity to connect with the environment where they live. Uh, she is GOL's uh, uh, the school district, Leadville uh, County School District liaison, supporting the district's nature-based learning programs, and also leads up their youth advisory council and youth development programs. Mary loves introducing people to new experiences in the outdoors and believes that it is never too late to try something new. Uh, Mary has been working in the outdoor industry for over a decade as an environmental educator raft guide, snowboard instructor, zipline guide, and climbing instructor. Her favorite things are quiet snowy trails, a good cup of coffee, and making art. We'll also hear from Becca Katz, um, who served as Get Outdoors Leadville's Community Learning Director for Lake County School District and Get Outdoors Leadville for four years before stepping in as their interim director in January 2021. As interim director, Becca uh, led up Get Outdoors Leadville's search for community for its next leader, helping them move into the next phase of success, supporting Lake County community's vision for culturally responsive, nature-inspired experiences. As community learning director, Becca worked with teachers, administrators, and staff at Lake County School District and local outdoor programming providers to design and implement outdoor experiences to enhance learning and culture building efforts in schools. Outside of work, she enjoys biking, camping, and being outside. So without further ado, we'll welcome, I believe we're gonna hear from Becca first, is that correct? All right, so um, thank you so much for, um, for allowing us to share and um, join the community of practice um, I've been able to be part of this. I do want to just um, give a plug for what Sharon was just talking about from June 2nd. It was really inspiring to see it all sort of in this retrospective view. It's been a pretty whirlwind of a year and it's been really inspiring to be part of this collective. Um, so I'm just grateful to be here. So as um, Lauren just mentioned, Mary and I are here to chat with you today and I'm going to give you a little bit of background on, um, on oops. Okay, so for today, we'll be talking a little bit about what Lake County School District is, what Get Outdoors Leadville is, um, this year in our COVID response, and what's next. Um, these are sort of the prompts that Sharon asked us to speak on. So, um, let's see. Um, first and foremost, it's important to understand Leadville and Lake County in order to understand this presentation. I feel like almost everyone is from California, um, and we are not. We are in a mountain town at 10,200 feet. We have a population of about 8,000 people in our whole county. Um, we're 83% public lands, um, mostly national forests, and the school year is winter. Um, that is like pretty much um, winter occupies that, which means temperatures between zero and 40 degrees for the bulk of the learning year. So that definitely impacts the way things look here in comparison with other environments. We are a school district that's pretty small. This is our enrollment from this year's 935 students. That's down a little bit from a normal year. Obviously, pandemic hurt a lot of districts. We are a Title I school district, which means we're a high poverty school district. Um, about 60% of our students are eligible for free and reduced lunch. That's what FRL stands for. 39% um, of our learners are English language learners. 70% um, 70 of our students, of our student body is minority, which sounds like an oxymoron, I guess. Um, a majority minority district, predominantly Latinx um, students. So a little bit of context that's important is that Lake County School District became an expeditionary learning district back in 2014. And expeditionary learning, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, 
it's now called EL Education. They don't have the word expeditionary in their name anymore, but they are a learning model that's hands-on. It's about doing things. It's about challenging, adventure, um, and authentic learning. And when we adopted that model, we were a failing school district, and it was a model that was adopted to try to turn our district around. Um, so we were under some pressure from the state to turn our district around. And the community and teachers um, sort of unanimously came together to decide to try expeditionary learning. And what they were looking for was something that would be, you know, like backpacking and canyons and like adventure um, and lots of nature based things. But really, when it came down to it, although the spirit was there, there wasn't actually a ton of um, expertise in the district to support the really expeditionary component of expeditionary learning when it comes to the adventure piece of it. So, and the nature-based piece of it. So we, Get Outdoors Leadville happened to come on the scene. We're a grant funded initiative through uh, um, Colorado lottery dollars are um, allocated for, con some Colorado lottery dollars are allocated for conservation through Great Outdoors Colorado. And they funded an initiative to connect all youth in the entire state of Colorado with nature. Um, and our community received a grant from that um, pool of money to better connect youth in our community to nature. And we did some of that through the schools. So this has been a partnership and it was actually a really nice um, pairing with the expeditionary learning model because it allowed us to support um, sort of the vision that the community had had for expeditionary learning with some real hands-on nature-based learning field work. So we spent about four years um, developing um, a nature-based learning progression. Um, and Lauren, if you wanna throw that link in the chat for the, the first link about the progression, if you're interested in reading more about this progression, um, it's detailed and it's also in that link that's at the bottom of the page, but it combines short doses of time outdoors with immersive um, experiences outdoors. It combines backyard experiences, which we use to refer to things that are just like right outside the school door, right outside the building and backcountry experiences. They could be in the canyons of Utah, um, in the mountains, which are kind of our backyard, but are still more remote and wildernessy. Um, and they really are about enhancing and accelerating our achievement of district-wide goals, both in academic and culture arenas. So the point that I think is really important to make is Sharon had asked sort of like, where have you been with nature-based learning before the pandemic? So like this was all happening before the pandemic, right? So think about 2017 is about when this all um, really got underway. And so we had a lot of nature-based learning established in our district before the pandemic started, which was really um, helpful. The other thing to note is that we did recognize, and this is something that I've heard come up in this community of practice countless times, but the need for teacher capacity building and professional development when it comes to um, nature-based learning and outdoor learning. So we, we knew that our teachers had the heart for it, right? Like they chose this model. They love, a lot of them moved here because they love the outdoors. So we also knew the science behind the value of students spending time outdoors, right? There's cognitive benefits, there's health and wellness benefits, there's social, emotional, just safety benefits to youth of being outdoors. And we also know that kids are in school a lot of hours, like 160 days is the requirement in Colorado. It's probably more in some states and slightly less than others. Um, that's about 900 hours of outdoor time or of time a year that could be spent outdoors um, if we move it. So we were already pushing in that direction but we knew that we needed to support our teachers in feeling like they had the skills. Um, and specifically we thought, wow, access to the outdoors is an amazing lever for educational justice because of the benefits that we see. And if we can get our kids outdoors more accessing those health and wellness and cognitive benefits, then wow, we're moving the needle on, on justice in our community. So it was a really big opportunity. Um, but we also learned that in, in working with teachers, you know, Teachers are experts at what they do. They are expert student managers, they're experts at engagement, um, they're experts at their content area. And so oftentimes it was not about saying like, hey, you have to do this whole new thing and you need to be trained and you don't know anything. It was more about like, you are amazing and you do this really hard job. How can we just give you some practical tools to get that outside? So we developed two main trainings. Um, the first one is really the primary one, the Taking Kids Outdoors or TKO, where we really focused on the why. Um, so the, again, those cognitive and social emotional benefits, sometimes it takes a little bit of extra effort to get students outdoor learning, especially at first. And so if you want to get that sort of startup energy, giving that really powerful reasoning why, teachers care a ton about their students um, and they want 
to make the best things happen for them. And if you can tell them that the best thing is for them to be out in nature and actually prove it with data, then they find that really compelling and they're really excited to um, put in that extra work um, to do so. And then we really wanted to give them skills on stewardship, teaching stewardship um, or cultivating stewardship, um, planning and preparation, student management, risk management, leave no trace, um, and inclusivity and equity in outdoor spaces. So we developed that training as a four hour training and more than 60% of our educators district wide have taken it at this point. Um, so that has been a really powerful thing. A lot of them have then applied it. Um, we also developed this Brains on Nature course um, and this is really a deep dive and it's a backpacking trip for teachers but it's not about teaching kids how to backpack. It's about creating a retreat context where teachers can really, um, educators, administrators as well, can really think about like the really deep science and all the different ways that nature-based learning can be done and can look and how it can really go deeper. And then every teacher leaves this course with a thoroughly vetted plan for how they and their discipline, whether they're a special ed teacher or a 11th grade English teacher or a principal at the high school, how they can bring nature-based learning into their core work so that we can really maximize the amount that this is happening. So that was all happening before COVID. And the reason I did all that first is because I think it's just important to have that context. Oh, and Lauren, if you want to throw the link, that other link in there, that's, um, there are still some pot spots on the Brains on Nature course if you're interested in joining us this summer. So shameless plug, um, if you want to register for that course, we'd love to have you join us out here in Colorado for um, a trip and immersive um, experience about nature-based learning. Um, in terms of COVID response, I think that the important things to underscore here mostly covered in, we, we're one of the case studies that's featured on the Green School Yards website. And Lauren, I don't know if you have that link accessible, but that really covers a lot of the detail. But essentially, because we have been doing so much nature-based learning for years, and because we are well-established in partnership with our school district, we were well-primed and set up to kind of say like, hey, like this is the safest place for students to be on um, both social emotional wellness wise and physical safety. And so how can we be part of this response? And so really essentially for the first eight weeks of school, we designed a program that students were with their teachers um, for two days of the school week and they were with us they were with us in partner programming, doing outdoor learning, um, partner programming with an organization called the 100 Elk Outdoor Center. That's an environmental ed center just south of town. And we, they were able to be with their teachers um, half time and with us half time. And we have a four day school week here. So um, all year round, four days a week. So um, two days with their teacher, two days with us. Um, and with the 100 Elk Outdoor Center. And then it pivoted into a different model that really leveraged a lot of after school partnerships um, that still included an extensive amount of outdoor work. And um, the other thing to mention is that we have a summer program called Rocky's Rock and Eden here in the corner with the bug on his finger and the mask on. He is a camper in that Rocky's Rock program. And we actually did offer day camp last summer, which many day camps did not operate. Um, and it was all outdoors and tons and tons of practices were put in place and our school district actually used a ton of the learning that was found during Rocky's Rock to um, develop its practices. So again, another place of a really strong partnership between the district and Get Outdoors Loveville. So from this COVID response and like the really intense pandemic response of the fall and early spring, um, we've now tried to move back into sort of the nature-based learning progression that we were already doing and then maybe enhance it as well. And so Mary is going to speak a little bit about that. Great. Thanks, Becca. So yeah, this winter and spring season, we were able to reinstate several fieldwork experiences, which was so crucial for our teachers and students. Um, it was a much needed break from the challenges of navigating online learning um, and really just a, a place for students to bond with their teachers in a way that really wasn't available to them um, just because of all the kind of ever-changing learning formats and all that. So um, teachers were actually reaching us in hopes of taking their students outdoors and just initiating these experiences more than we've ever seen before. Um, and I think this was possible due to a couple key factors. Um, one is just to Becca's point of we have spent the last three years, three to four years building um, systems and the buy-in within our district. So the foundation was already there. 
Um, so for example, a vast majority of our district has already received training and taking kids outdoors. And because of that, they kind of know what to expect from a fieldwork day. Um, they're able to prepare their students and make sure that they're ready to go outdoors. They have preset like communications that happen between families to make sure that families are comfortable and know how to you know, send their students ready to go. Um, and they also have just an awareness of all the internal checks that need to happen within the school to make sure that students have medical and behavioral supports in place when they go out into the field. So just having all those systems that were kind of readily available and that had been practiced for a few years was um, pretty crucial and just allowing teachers to kind of initiate that um, when they were ready to take students back out into the field. Another key factor is we've spent the last several years building relationships with our community partners. So they were also bought in um, and just willing to kind of be adaptable with us and kind of roll with what we needed um, as far as just making changes to schedules and staffing needs. So that was wonderful. Um, and kind of additionally to that, we've also been working with local land management agencies to just understand permitting requirements and systems for using public land. So we were able, again, to kind of communicate with them our needs and flex some of our permitting and just make sure we had that access to public space. Um, finally, another tactic that we implemented in the district that's been really successful is curriculum banking. And so that's basically um, a tactic where we meet with teachers who are interested in planning some nature-based curriculum for their students. And we work with them to identify kind of a framework for the lesson they're seeking, um, what's the content area, the goals in mind. Um, and then we actually contract with one of our local partners, GARNA, Greater Arkansas Valley, um, Nature Association, um, and they're kind of experts at curriculum development and connecting youth to the outdoors. So they're able to develop lesson plans and we essentially bank them, kind of tuck them away for future use. So since the curriculum's already written, teachers can implement these lessons year after year and they're able to adapt their plans based on available funding for that year or kind of what their parameters are. So they have the tools to implement these nature-based lessons with minimal outside resources if needed. Um, they can kind of be scaled up or scaled down depending on um, if they wanna keep it more local or if we have you know available funding for buses and extra guest speakers and stuff. So we we sort of just empower teachers to create these curriculums that can be used year after year, um, depending on what their needs are. And another big piece for that was we were just lucky to be able to be pretty flexible with our funding. So we have some funding allocated to support field work in our district and teachers have really relied on that for the last few years. So we were able to accommodate extra buses because of the reduced capacities, we could bring in extra staff to make sure we had smaller groups and just make sure that these outings felt really comfortable for school staff and for families. And we can just go to the next slide. So as far as kind of lessons learned and carrying um, things forward to next year. The question of did time outside change future programming? I believe the answer is yes. Um, a few observations I've made, our students in our district spent time outside nearly every day. Um, so going on regular hikes through the woods, building forts, engaging in imaginative play. And because of this extra time, the schoolyard and the woods surrounding it will remain a place that belongs to students. Um, so we're just seeing this really neat increased sense of pride and ownership in their outdoor learning environments. Um, so it's really neat to see students just kind of feeling comfortable and confident playing in those spaces and kind of interacting with their peers. Students were also able to build routines for how to properly prepare to go outside. So since they were doing it on such a regular basis, um, it just became part of kind of their school routine of, I know when I go outdoors, I need, you know, these items to prepare for specific weather. And I know that, you know, I, I have my specific way that I, I move from the classroom to the outdoor space. Um, and just being able to set those consistent expectations and boundaries for when we're outside with our class during the school day, here's what's expected and we know the boundaries and we know how to stay safe outside. 
And one case in particular, our middle school principal has had initial conversations about how to institutionalize more time outside for classrooms. So we're, you know, working with her to identify potential obstacles for infusing that within the school day and just figuring out how we can problem solve um, this idea to support more kind of balance between academic learning and time outside for more mental and social well being. And then so kind of in closing, do we think the pandemic will have a permanent effect on outdoor learning for our district and for goal? Um, really, I think there was really a resounding um, understanding of the outdoors as a tool for social and emotional well being. And I think that was heard pretty loud and clear this year with our community. Um, so with that, I believe school staff is more inclined to turn to the outdoors as a resource for problem solving, for creating more balance within their school day to make sure that we have those mental health spaces in place. For example, we saw creative ideas emerge such as incentives for academic achievement at the high school level. Um, so students who brought their failing grades up to passing by a certain benchmark um, were rewarded with an afternoon of outdoor play with their friends. Um, and that was facilitated in partnership with Goal. Um, we also saw an increase of teachers just communicating amongst themselves and um, reserving outdoor classroom spaces and, you know, communicating, hey, we're taking our lesson outside today and just really sort of owning that system um, that was developed over the last few years of just, um, we have some established um, outdoor classroom spaces at each of our schools. And so those were really activated this year. And I'm just going to close by zooming out for one second to our community at large. Since all students were getting to spend more time outdoors and being exposed to new activities like hiking and biking and swimming and ice skating um, during the school day and had the support to build skills and comfort with those new activities, our rec department reported a significant increase in visitorship to their facilities and programs, especially from folks traditionally underrepresented groups. So students were able to develop these new outdoor skills and new knowledge, and then they were sharing that with their families. Um, so it was an unexpected positive outcome that we believe will carry forward of just empowering students with the comfort and ability to be outdoors and then like making sure that that is filtering back into our community at large, which is just really powerful and, and wonderful. So I'll close there. Thank you so much for letting us share our, our COVID experience. Thank you so much, uh, Mary and Becca. That was fantastic. It was so exciting to hear about what you've been doing uh, before COVID and during COVID and how that will change your, your work in the future. I'm, I'm just thrilled to hear it and just congratulations on it and a big round of applause from all of us here today um, for your presentation. Thank you. And we, we have some time for questions and I want to make sure that, that people can ask them. So please feel free to put questions in the chat, everybody. I see one there now for you both that says, uh, what do you do on the fifth day of the week? Or do, do you just have self, self-care self day off? How is how is the school year structured at a four-year day? A four-day four week, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so four-day weeks are increasingly common, uh, particularly in Colorado, actually. I forgot what percentage of districts, but it's upwards of 25% of districts, I believe. Um, are on four day weeks. So that fifth day varies a lot from, from community to community. In our community, when we decide to adopt a four day calendar, um, one, all the teacher professional development and capacity building days um, fall on that fifth day. So, um, and then on top of that, I think one of the commitments that we made that was really like loud and clear from our community was that on the fifth day, they um, wouldn't, it was really important that kids had a place to be, um, even though it's actually not a net increase in the amount of childcare needed, right? It's like summer versus, it's the same number of days of school just spread over a longer period of time. So that's important to emphasize, but we were committed to figuring that out. So we actually, um, with some community partners, not we get outdoors level, but the school district um, developed a plan with community partners to provide um, fifth day programming. So essentially there's community partner programming in a normal year that was supposed to be this year, um, fifth day programming. This was the first year of this calendar. So um, a weird time to start, but um, programming from partners that parents could opt into if they um, needed that support and extra care. So essentially parents are getting like 32 extra days of childcare a year um, in this model. I, I love that you talked about how the, the, the yard um, and the space around it will be part of the permanent kind of 
permanent um, use zones of the schools and that the kids will have uh, have more outdoor skills and have more routines um, to be going outside. And can you talk about like what what kinds of responsibilities um, or talk a little bit more about what kinds of responsibilities you'd say were handed over to kids to help as helpers of organizing that outdoor process and like what goes into their routines and what kind of gear setup do they each know how to do now, would you say? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think I'll refer back to Becca's point of just like, we have pretty challenging weather to take students out in. So I think a lot of it just has to do with really making sure that all kids have an equitable chance to be comfortable and safe when they're outside. So a lot of that is just learning how to make a packing list and know what goes in your backpack every time you go outside and what should be on your body to make sure that you're safe and comfortable. So, you know, a lot of our teachers spent multiple lessons, like developing packing lists, practicing, getting ready and lining up at the door and knowing that, you know, your items are ready to go. And then also just having kids take inventory of, do you not have something at home? Well, then we actually have what are called class packs um, at each of the schools. And they're just big duffel bags full of extra clothing that have been donated by community members. And so the teachers know that they take inventory with their students and they hand out extra items that are needed. The kids can either keep it if they need it or they can just use it for the day. So um, yeah, really making sure that the kids sort of have that skill of preparing to go outside in cold weather and they're actively, you know, checking each other, checking um, themselves and making sure that they're ready to go out. Um, and I think the other big part was around just the stewardship of being outdoors and um, students were pretty actively involved in just maintaining the schoolyard and making sure that we're um, keeping it neat and tidy and, you know, um, just caring for the land. So, yeah, I think that was um, an, a couple other things too, I think there were just some ways that we could connect what are the classroom expectations that actually still exist outside. Um, and then what are some extra things that we have to keep in mind as far as being outdoors together? Oh, that's so great. It sounds like a lot of really important life skills to have in a place that's cold in the winter to know how, how to do those things. And, and it reminds me of a is I think a national curriculum in Norway that curriculum standards set that's about learning the outdoor skills, the kinds of things you're talking about. I'm so happy to hear that's happening where you are and, and that the equity considerations um, sound fantastic and important. Um, going to a couple of more questions in the in the chat. We have one one question that asks if if your positions are paid for by the school district or by the nature center or some other place. How is it funded? We are, so our initiative is entire, is almost entirely grant funded. There's some um, additional funding that comes in from, you know, fundraisers and other things, but um, both of our positions. So my position was actually nested in the school district. I was a, actually a school district employee and I um, basically held the job that Mary has now for the first few years. And then it, my, it sort of pivoted into a, a slightly different configuration. Mary now is actually an employee of Get Outdoors Leadville, but still all funded by, um, a grant, by grants, um, particularly our grant from our Colorado Lottery Dollars um, that helps pay for it. Thank you. And another logistics question about bathrooms and outdoors. Um, what bathroom facilities are used for outdoor learning? Yeah, that's a, a great concern and consideration. Um, luckily, the way that our outdoor classrooms are positioned, um, they're very accessible to the school. So um, we're able to just have them use the bathroom before they go out and we're able to have enough staff people with each group that they can run kids just back and forth to the building. Um, if we're off site at a, a different space, um, we definitely just ensure that bathrooms are open and available and we work with the land managers to just alert them that we're coming and just make sure that all that's in place. On certain kind of more backcountry experiences, that's definitely a skill that is taught is using the restroom outside. So with some of our older kiddos and even at summer camp, we actually 
incentivize kids who are able to go number two outside all by themselves and they get like a, a special um, poop bead award that goes on their little bracelet. So I think there's kind of a balance between kind of breaking down the, the fear about going outside, um, some skill building and awareness, and then also, you know, just making sure that we're including that um, as a consideration. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you, I love that. Um, and one last question before we go to the breakout groups. Um, are, it's about executive functioning skills. Are you monitoring kids' abilities to organize their own learning inside the classroom as an extension of organizing themselves to go outside? I would say, no, we haven't done a lot of that. Mary, I don't know if you have a different answer to that, but um, in a formal way, no, I think that you know students are learning to self-regulate in different environments and that's certainly related to executive function, but in terms of actual like measurement or data, um, not really. I do, I would say that one thing, and this is only sort of tangentially related to um, this question, but we have a lot of anecdotal data at this point from our teachers about the different experience that they have with their students when they take them outdoors. Um, we have a we have a teach an art teacher who is now in her, this was her fifth year of doing um, an Andy Goldsworthy inspired art project in the forest. And um, for those of you who don't know Andy Goldsworthy, he does basically um, in situ ephemeral art pieces um, composed comprised of nature um, leaves and sticks and ice and other things. And our students do an art um, unit based on that. And she said, you know, in her, you know, 15 years in the classroom, she's never seen the kind of concentration that she sees in students when they're doing that unit. And she's actually said that it's the only art unit and she teaches art. She said it's the only art unit that she's had to actually like pry students away from their work and bring them back. Like, and say like, you have to go to your next class. Like you can't, <laughs> can't keep doing this. So I think that there is some anecdotal like that, anecdotal evidence like that about about just self-regulation and curiosity and cognitive function that's being enhanced through these outdoor things. But in terms of executive function specifically, I wouldn't have any any real concrete evidence there. Mary, I don't know if you have some. No, that's a great point to raise of just connecting the transferable skills of preparing and managing yourself outdoors and bringing that into the classroom. I think I will add that um, in conjunction with the action X expeditionary learning um, module. Um, basically, we have seven crew skills, um, you know, perseverance, compassion, respect that we bring to the outdoors. And I think that's a way that we can really like have these concrete examples of like, you know, persevering through a moment of being outside and like trying to write on your notebook when it's really cold outside. And so I think when we're able to bring students outside, like a lot of those crew practices come to life and um, that can kind of transfer back to the classroom um, and offers just this great reflection point where kids can kind of experience those things um, in a more um, kind of concrete way. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you guys. Yeah, thank you so much, you both, for coming today and for sharing your work. It's just incredible and fabulous. And we are happy to have, we'll put this recording up on the website for everyone to, to share and the links that you shared as well will join it. So um, I just wanted you all to know that you'll be able to see it later and share it with your colleagues. And thank you so much, Becca and Mary. We just really appreciate your work.